I'm listening to a, a, a marriage teaching CD by Todd Friel, and I was surprised, but that's the angle he goes at. He says it's, it's not about a bunch of things on how we are to get from our spouses and how we want them to get to be what we want for ourselves. It's all about God. It's about loving God, realizing who we are, where we are, how much has God loved us, not punishing our spouses, but just loving them no matter what. And if both spouses are doing that, that's a wonderful, beautiful marriage. Even if one spouse is doing that, well then, the other spouse is getting a beautiful picture of God's love right there, as you're loving them the way you ought to be loved. And, that's a, and it, it's a lot less stressful, too, rather than get yourself all worked up. <laughs> that's for sure. All right, I have a PowerPoint right here. I kind of have a lot of slides here. Don't worry, it won't be too bad. This is kind of a strange passage because it's like two passages in one, but it's like it's sandwiched the one in the middle. So I don't want to, you know, bounce back and forth and you're like, I just heard that sermon a week ago. So basically the, we're going to hear the, this first passage of the heartfelt plea is what I call it from Paul. And then we're going to hear a passage about separate ourselves okay, from things that would draw us away from God. And this, if you've got your Bibles, that's where it will be at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 to 7, 4. So that's the passage we're going into. And I have a few, a few introduction things, but one introduction slide. Evil men will try to ruin your reputation and cause damage. This was pretty much the backdrop of the historical setting of why this was written. Because Paul is defending himself at a church that he founded and set up and pastored for 18 months went away for a little while, and a bunch of other fellows had come in They were teaching a different gospel. They were mixing Bible stuff with paganism, and they were doing all these crazy things, and they were trying to talk really bad about Paul and trying to discredit him. And Paul wasn't just another pastor. Paul was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's words were God's words. So it's not just an effect of a challenge against Paul, but it was a challenge against God. And Paul had to stand up because he loved these people and he wanted to bring them back in. And I gave an example in history of what another guy, Martin Luther, did. The palpable excommunicating Martin Luther said of him, this is what they said when Martin Luther stood up to believe in the Bible. They said, this Luther favors the Bohemians and the Turks. And I'll tell you what, we have a few Germans here today, <laughs> more than just one. And they, a lot of them don't like the Turks, okay? <laughs> it's not a nice thing for them to say this. I think it was probably the same way in Germany back then as well. Because there was a lot of wars and different things that went on. The Luther, this Luther favors the Bohemians and the Turks, deplores the punishment of heretics, spurns the writing of the holy doctors, the decrees of the ecumenical councils, and the ordinances of the Roman pontiffs, and gives credence to the opinions of none save himself alone, which no heretic before ever presumed to do. Those are some very strong words against Luther from the, the main church of the time, the Roman church at the time. And the same way that they tried to ruin Martin Luther's reputation, this is the same picture we have going back in Corinthians and how they were trying to ruin Paul's reputation. So this first passage, this heartfelt plea, is Paul letting everybody know who he is. And he's not there for harm, he's there for good. And he's not there to, to, to mislead anybody, that he's not a heretic, that he believes the Word of God. And he actually uses a lot of Bible to interpret his teachings. So, of course, that's a good method. And I have extra verses, too, for a week. And make sure we get the right Bible teaching by interpreting Bible with Bible. And if you look in your bulletins on the back, I didn't put this up, this PowerPoint, some of them match up, but you can see what pretty much each verse is summed up as. You know, like this first verse is summed up as honesty. Because Paul said, Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians, our heart is opened wide. And this this is a, a beautiful way to be, to, to not have to look at somebody and think, are they really thinking something else? Are they, are they really present with me? Are they really on my side and for me? Or are they like a, a person that's ready to stab me in the back as soon as I walk away? Paul was not that kind of person. Everything he said was open. His heart was open wide. And he was there 
for the people, he loved the people, and he didn't have any kind of evil intention whatsoever for these people. And that's why he said, he says that, he goes, our heart is open wide. And he said, you are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. They were self-restrained and they were believing lies. They had been emotionally driven. And we're all human beings and we all have emotions. And that's good. God gave us emotions. He gave us uh, you know, feelings. He gave us passions and things. But we have to be very careful that we don't let someone come along that does not have our best interests in mind to emotionally drive us in a different direction. Because that's what the false apostles and the church had done to the Corinthians. And that's why he says they were restrained by their own affections. Paul wasn't trying to mislead them. He wasn't doing things like that. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to make anyone take offense, but some churches, what they'll do is they'll preach such a eloquent message, and then at the end, they'll be like, everybody that wants to get saved, come on down here to the front, and they'll lower the lights and dim them, and they'll lower the music nice and soft, and they'll even sometimes they'll have other people in the churches like setups to come down as well so that people will see other people are coming down so everybody will come down and pray and receive the Lord Jesus and it's really a bunch of emotionally driving stuff and I've been in churches like that and I've been swayed myself with my emotions to want to go down and things like that and, and, and you got to be so careful with that and a lot of those churches they do that because they want everyone else to see look at what a wonderful ministry this is look at this but then how many of those people's lives are really being changed for Christ? You know, you can be emotionally driven. That doesn't mean that you stay the same the next day. That doesn't mean that it's changed your life. Really, for something to change your life, it's got to be God's Word being preached, it working inside your heart with the Holy Spirit of God working there, and then the change starts to grow and happen just like the way a plant grows, and before you know it, it's on the outside too. But if you try to just wrap it all up into like a giant emotional thing and draw everybody in, it's like a magic show. And the magic show at the end, people are back to the same way they were before. And then they just rely on some experience as their theology. Some experience is what, of what God means to them. And it's much more than an experience. It's a truth. It's a, it's a way of life. It's a, it's a it's a taking the blinders off the eyes from a blind man and a dead man and seeing life in full color. It's a beautiful thing. And, and that's just what had happened to them was the, these guys had come in and man, they knew how to work the magic. And they got the Corinthians. And he's letting them know, I'm not trying to work that magic with you. I'm not trying to grab your affections and pull you in like that. I'm here to just share with you the truth. Share with you the words of God, the love of God. He says in the next verse, Now in a like exchange, I speak as to children, open wide to us also. Now, I wrote here, there's non-returned love is painful. I'm sure everybody here, being a human being, has felt non-returned love. Especially if you love your children, and then your children tell you they hate you, or they don't return the love back to you, and it just breaks your heart. That's, that's a painful experience. And he's pointing this out. He's pointing this out that he has opened wide his heart to them. And they have not been returning the love back to him. You know, they've been believing the lies about him. They've been walking a different way and away from him. And he's in pain. And he's giving that example as if he's speaking toward his own children. Because you remember earlier Corinthians even said that he's like a father to them. You know, because he's the one that grew the church and pastored and led them taught him and yet they've gone away and it's breaking his heart and uh, and what we're gonna see we're gonna see over here at 7-2 we're gonna go over there now I should have just put 7-2 there but I wasn't thinking about it at the time but I could, if we don't do this our train of thought will be all broken so 7-2 is where the same idea picks back up but don't worry we're not skipping scriptures we're gonna go back to those he says, make room for us in your hearts. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. And Paul really did. He hadn't done all these kind of horrible things. And the same things that we have going on today in society, we're going around back then too. Okay, There were people trying to get rich off of people by 
peddling the Word of God. And, and i seen it myself, me and my wife, I remember when we first moved to Florida, when we left Germany in 2010, we went to like 10 different churches until we found a church that didn't spend like 10 minutes trying to beg all the money out of everybody in the church and make them feel guilty for not giving and make them feel like they don't have any faith because they can't give anything. You know, it should be a, a free will offering is what the Bible says. Really, if you look at the Old Testament, they had boxes in the temple. We have boxes of stuff somebody ever wants to give. And if you think about the story that Jesus said about the, the old widow, how she dropped her one mite in and how that meant more than anything. And part of that was is because the rich guys liked that big sound to drop in all their change. And all she had was one little mite, but yet that meant everything. And it's not about the trying to drag everybody's money out or rip them off. And really that's a reason a lot of people won't come to church. You know, maybe you can ask somebody to come to our church and let them know, hey, we don't even take an offering. We don't even pass the plate. We don't even pressure anybody. I don't usually don't even talk about it. I just talk about these right now because it's right here. And Paul was pointing out, too, that he wasn't trying to take advantage of anyone, okay? I'm not saying we shouldn't give. We should give. We should give our whole selves to God in every way. That's one thing that we should give, too. But, but I'm just saying that's not correct And so many times church today and even church then I bet had become like a business a, a way of making money a way of of just thriving and unfortunately today if you look at the TV the guys that are the best at that business are multi-millionaires at a hundred million dollars that's horrible how can you be a hundred million dollar person and take somebody that's maybe a five thousand a year dollar person and want their money every month and take that away from them. You ought to be giving to them is what you should be doing. If you're a believer in Christ, you know, a hundred million dollars, you ought to be supporting the people that you supposedly love and watching over. Yeah, I mean, likewise, you know, the church has to have some money, but it doesn't need a hundred million dollars, that's for sure. If it does, let me tell you, that if I had a hundred million dollars, we'd have church, little church plants all over the entire country preaching the Bible is what we were having. That's what we'd be funded. Well, I wouldn't have some giant $100 million house, I'll guarantee you that. But maybe what else they were talking about here is 1 Corinthians 5, man. Because if you remember, a while ago we preached 1 Corinthians 5, there was a guy who was sleeping with his stepmother. And that was a bad issue within the church. And the church was taking a blind eye to it. And Paul said, this guy needs to go. He goes, hand him over to Satan for a time that he might... Feel the roughness of the world and feel the, the roughness of what he's done wrong so that he would repent and come back to Christ. Now, he didn't kick him out for good. He kicked him out so that way it wouldn't be this bad position right there. So maybe that's what they were talking. They are like, what about that poor guy? Which a lot of people believe he came back to the church because it talked about a few chapters before about some brother that came back to the church. And they said, make sure you welcome him. Make sure you love him. Make sure you bring him right back in. You know, Don't hold anything against him. Don't judge him. And, uh, and this, these were the kind of points that he was talking about. And then I take you back to an earlier time here, right, that we preached about a few weeks ago, but this connects well. For we, who, for we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. So I, I wrote up here, the opposite was true. It wasn't that he was trying to take stuff from his congregation, from the Corinthians, that he wasn't trying to, to gain personal ways from them. He was dying for them. He was giving his life up for them that they may have life. He was humbly enduring suffering and hardship for them on their behalf. This is the kind of model pastor, model person that should be leading churches, not some guy that's trying to get, 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 and let me show you all my gold rings and my fancy cars and, and all these things. That's just not the right way, okay? He was for them. He was dying for them. And really, if you read the Bible about Paul, he was not living a life that any of us would probably choose to live, okay? He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was thrown in prison. He was stoned. He wasn't having a nice time. He, he made tents for a living. During, during the daytime, so he could be preaching at the nighttime and be with the people, he really endured a lot of things for these people. And back into the scripture passage when it says, I do not speak to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts 
to die together and to live together. So he wasn't telling them, hey, I'm here to judge you. I'm here to condemn you. No, that's not our job. I tell you, the only person's job to judge is God. It's God's job to judge. It's not us. I, I told you I'm listening to that marriage marriage thing. If anybody want to borrow, you can't. Top Reels has got a whole different way of speaking and teaching. But he points out that, let's say, if your husband or your wife is doing something that you don't like, even if it is a sinful thing, for you to punish them is ungodly. God's the one, if they're a believer, he was already punished for their sins on the cross. He was punished for whatever they're doing to you right now. He was already punished for it. So why are you going to try to punish them again when God took that punishment upon himself on the cross? It's not the right way. We need to, we need to get back into perspective and we need to get close to God. There's nothing wrong with letting people know what our desires are, you know, how we feel about things and what we would like, but there's a difference when we start to punish people. And that's not the right way. And he points out here too that he is not punishing them. He's not there to punish any of them. All right? He's saying that they're in the heart, die together and live together. He wasn't trying to punish them and, and hurt them that they would never come back to the church again, that they would never be there again. He was trying to just help them is what he's trying to do. It's the same as 1 Corinthians 5. If you read 1 Corinthians 5, that's by the other guy, it does talk about judging people within the church. You know, in order that we don't have a church that's going in all kinds of chaotic, crazy, different directions, okay? That we have a church that's based on the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not talking about people that first start coming to the church or people that are still growing. That's talking about people who are, are solidly proclaiming Christians and they're walking in blatant sin. And it's a loving thing is to come up to them, talk to them gently, and be like, hey, have you thought about what you're doing? You know, because we all need a little check once in a while. We need people to come alongside. None of us are good all by ourselves. We all need the Lord Jesus Christ and we need each other. But it's in love. And he points this out. There's no final verdict, but it was truth and love. And he had an undying loyalty to the rebellious. And this is something, too, that's very important for us to have as well. You get somebody that's rebellious, that doesn't like you no more, that goes away from you. You don't try to start sending some arrows after them, shooting them and things. All right, you still love them. You love them the same way you loved them before. The way I look at things is, is I surely do believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. But I also believe that if you're not walking a Christian life, you shouldn't feel a lot of assurance that you're a saved person, that you're in a good place. You should. You should come back to the Lord and be in a good place right there. And we shouldn't try to comfort people in blatant sin and say, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. Because it might not be okay for them. All right, You want to love them and try to encourage them to come back. But you got to have this undying loyalty toward them not to give up on them. Not to stop loving them and just still keep being with them and trying to do everything you can to bring them back into the fold of God. The verse is very much like this is in Proverbs 27.6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. How true is this? If your friend tells you something that maybe you don't want to hear, but he's really your friend or she's really your friend, it's because they want to help you out. They want to, they want to do good things for you. And usually our reaction when we get wounded is to wound back. All right? <laughs> and it's not good, but it is the human condition. It's what we do. Somebody wounds us, we want to wound right back. And as we grow in our faith and as we mature in Christ, we should come to a point where we get a little wounded and we stop and we think, who is this wounding? Should maybe really be going on. Maybe I am kind of messed up right here and I need to change and I need to grow. And it's not easy. It's not easy for any of us. But it's something that we got to constantly, with everything in life, bring it back to God. Bring it to prayer. You know, bring it to the scriptures and say, is this stuff true? Where am I? You know, look at that mirror of the scripture. Is this really me? that the person's pointing out, or is it, are they the ones that are confused? You know, we have to be able to do these kind of things. But it's faithful the wounds of a friend, but deceitful the kisses of an enemy. Okay, the bad guy may say to you, oh, don't listen to anything that church says. Don't listen to anything the Bible says. You can do whatever you want to do. That's a terrible thing to say, okay? God is a judge. God does have an absolute standard. It's not about whatever we make it to be. There is reality just like it's two plus two is four. And God has so much love and so much mercy, but yet the people who reject God and don't want God and want to go their own way, God has to be a just judge too. 
And it's just like the situation as if there was a courtroom and there was a judge and say you had a little kid and your little kid was blinded by some other little kid in a terrible way and the judge came to, to judge the, the parents and the kid that did the damage or the, the man that did the damage and if he were to say, oh, you know what, your record isn't so bad, I'll let you go. While this other person's blinded for the rest of their life, nobody would want that kind of justice. We all want justice. Problem is we just don't want justice for ourselves. But we all do want justice. We want a society where people do and respect one another in different things. And God is a just God and He doesn't let anything go. He doesn't let someone slide that does something wrong. He loves us way too much to let those things go on. But He's provided a way for every single person by the way of the cross is that Jesus, when He was on that cross, every one of your sins, if you're a believer, was laid upon Him and He was punished. The wrath of God was put on to the Son. The wrath of the Father put on to the Son to pay our penalty in full. That every single sin we've ever done was paid for by Jesus Christ. For anyone who will ever believe. And let me tell you, it wasn't some kind of a mismatch. God just kind of like threw the dice out and see where it goes. He knew exactly who was going to believe. He knew what sins he was paying for right there. And the only way we can know if our sins are paid for on the cross is to believe. When we believe, we can know he's not going to reject or turn away any single one of us. He loves us so much. And that always, all of those things were paid for. So we got to be careful because deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. And Paul had a noble example of genuine biblical love. That's what he's, he's giving. Paul is as he's talking to the people. I will. Don't worry. Don't worry. I have this under control. I know I have a, I have a, a sermon that's a little different today. All right, let me show you one other verse here. And a lot of people use this in weddings. It's a beautiful verse to use in weddings too. But it's Ruth 1, 16 to 17. This is kind of the same kind of devotion that Paul had to his people. And this is what he's telling them. He's showing them this heartfelt plea. And but Ruth said, this is after her husband died, her sister's, her sister-in-law's husband died. They were in a pagan land with pagans. And the, but the mom, of the, the sons they were married to were, were Israelite Jews that had gone away. And now the mother-in-law, the mother of those sons who had died is going back into the country. And she's got both her daughter-in-laws with her. And one gets up and leaves when she says, just go back home. I think they're Moabites. And, and this is what Ruth says to her mother-in-law. What a beautiful daughter-in-law this is. Imagine. But this is also, this is a beautiful verse, and I think it's the same kind of love Paul had for, for us, even for the people who were rebellious. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse if anything but death parts you and me. What a beautiful statement of love. This kind of love we ought to have for one another in the church too. We ought to have this kind of love, especially for our spouses and things. We got to have this kind of love. And this is the kind of love that Paul had for the people. It was an undying love that no matter what, he is going to keep on loving them. Okay? Back to the last verse before I move back to 614. All right, so we get this chain of thought in one block of passage. Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy in all our affliction. You talk about a hard verse to say. He just wrote a letter to a bunch of people who were rebelling against him, following a bunch of other people, name-calling him, saying bad things about him, saying he's not even a follower of God, trying to discredit him like crazy. And this is what he tells them. This is like what you'd read at the end of a love letter. Not in a, not in a, a self-defense letter. He says, great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. He's been boasting about these people, saying how much they love God, saying what incredible kind of people they are. And he's saying he's filled with comfort. You know, most of us, if someone's talking bad about us, it doesn't fill us with comfort. It fills with hatred or fills with anger or fills with disdain. He's filled with comfort from these people. And he, look at this. This is the top of it. He's overflowing with joy. He's got joy, 
joy deep-seated down in his heart. Oh, that joy that he's got, even in all of this affliction that he has going on. And this is the way that we're supposed to love others as well, like God loves us, despite whatever shortcomings anybody has. And this is to include the people that aren't like us, to include the, the people who aren't even believers like us. We're still supposed to love them too, so often in the church. And when we're about to talk about this passage, when you go to separation, people mistake this separating themselves as, you know what, that means I'm only going to be by my people in my way, in my little shelter, and everybody else is dead wrong, get away from me. There's a lot of churches like that. There's churches where no other church is the church except for their church. I'm sure you may have bumped into a church like this. You may have visited a church like this, maybe been a part of a church like this once. Or at least you saw some kind of joke about a church like this once. That they are the only church. Nobody else is around. One time me and my wife saw a church like that in Florida. And not that the guy wasn't preaching the Bible. He didn't preach the Bible. But the way that he preached the Bible was without love. And he would have told you, maybe there's one church about five states away you could go to besides my church. But other than that, nobody is following the Lord, and nobody's right. And that's definitely not the way it is, okay? It's not the way it is. And we're supposed to be loving all kinds of people the same way that God loves them. And I wrote at the top here, and you guys know that I get mad about this TV stuff. I put, no name it, claim it garbage, okay? This wasn't some kind of a, a positive attitude, like think positive, say positive things, and all these positive things will happen. Paul said he had joy in what? In his affliction. Things didn't get better for Paul. Things actually got way worse for Paul. Eventually, Paul got killed. Right? It's not a, uh, it's not a name it, claim it. I'm going to name this, I'm going to claim it, and that's the way it's going to be. Well, you know what? In your little world, it may be however you're able to decide on things, but even that, there's all these outside cultures that will come in on you. You know, bad things will happen to you. You'll get sick. So people will be rude, rough. They'll move in on your personal space. Even if you tried to do this just for yourself, it really wouldn't work out. It says, that does not, of course, remit that positive thoughts make good things happen. That's not true. In fact, it makes me so upset when I see people on Facebook and things and somebody puts a tragedy out there and they say, I love it when people say I'm praying for you because what better beautiful thing is that than you're praying for people. But some people say, I have good thoughts for you. I'm sending positive thoughts your way. Well, that's nice that they're saying they're doing that, but what good is that going to do the person? It's not going to do me any good for somebody to think positively about me in my situation. If they pray, God can interchange, intercede. God can change something. Praise God if they're praying. Or maybe if they're like, hey, I want to come talk to you, or I want to help you out, or how can I help the situation? Don't tell me you're sending me good thoughts, okay? Good thoughts don't... It's a nice, nice talk. It's a nice talk, but it doesn't have anything to it. Paul's hope was not that his positive attitude could change the Corinthians. True biblical love does not make good things happen, but believes and hopes for them. You could try the hardest you could try to see somebody get saved, and they may never get saved. But you know what? You keep loving them, because that's what you're called to do. That's what you're called to do. True, true love believes and hopes for them. You hope that they get saved. You believe, you believe the Lord's going to work in their life. You're praying for them and things. But it doesn't make things happen. It's only God that makes things happen. Therefore, despite their unfaithfulness, disloyalty, and sin, Paul maintained his confidence in the Corinthians. Not because of them, but because he knew that God would complete the saving work he had begun in them. Because if you remember Philippians 1.6, we said we have a guy that came to our church, and this was his favorite verse. And it is a beautiful verse. And it says in Philippians 1.6, that the good work that God started in you, that He will complete that good work. God is not ever going to just leave you as an empty shell and unfinished. He is working on every single one of us, and He says He will complete the good work He started in us. God isn't a God that starts a project, forgets about it, and walks away. When He starts the project of saving you, you are going to go all the way into the kingdom of heaven to the farthest depths of goodness and beauty and wonder He has ever made for everybody where He lives Himself. You're going to be there one day because He is the one who's doing that in you. You may have a rough time along the way, but you could realize and accept that He's the one doing it. I, I say it often, maybe I say it too often, but I think it's such a great picture, is that footsteps in the sand. 
and you die and you look back maybe and there's that poem footsteps in the sand and you saw where the Lord walked alongside you and then all of a sudden you don't see anything but one set of steps and you're like oh boy that's where I was in a horrible time in my life that's when uh, somebody I love died or that's when uh, horrible things happened or I had diseases or something why weren't you there Lord and he goes I was there I was the one carrying you through that time taking you through that time and I was there all the time with you and you can read the Bible and over and over again in the Old Testament the psalmist, other people call out, they're like, God, you've abandoned us. You're not here. You're gone. And then before you know it, God starts talking to him because he's been there the entire time. God never leaves us. He's always there for us. And he will save us. And he will bring things through for us. And we've got to have our faith in him, not in ourselves. If we put our faith in ourselves, we will get all confused. We'll get sad. We'll, we'll realize that things aren't the way we wanted them to be. And we'll be upset. But if we got our faith in the God that does it all, we can be satisfied. We can know everything is going to be okay. Now let me move back here. 6.14. You're like, oh no, second sermon. It's not a second sermon. It still lines right up, okay? Alright. 6.14 it says, and it really does go together, but to grab that, that thought, I think this works better. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have unrighteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Likely the unbelievers were the false apostles trying to lead the church in the wrong way. He's telling them, don't even be mixed in with these guys. Don't, don't connect yourself with these guys. There's definitely two different breeds of people. Okay, Two different kinds. I love Ken Ham's stuff and he talks about how you know all humans come from Adam and Eve. All dogs can come from one set of dogs, okay? They can have the genes for all those things. Uh, how did the ark contain two of every animal when there's so many different kinds of animals? Because really, you can classify them all down to about 7,000 different kinds. And then if they contain the, the, different, the different DNA, the different variations that we can all have as we have kids, as animals can have, as animals come around, all of that could have come back about again. So. Two different breeds of people, believers and unbelievers. We are two different kinds. We're not the same. We shouldn't intermix like this and think that I can be one with someone who's an unbeliever. We can't be, all right? There's no blending. And that's what these guys were maybe trying to do now is just to blend. And he, he gives these opposites, light with darkness, okay? I'll tell you what, when the light shines in the darkness, you can see. I got some chickens out back in my yard. And every night, I go out there to put them to bed. And when I put them to bed, I only go when it's dark, because otherwise it's too rough on me to run around and chase chickens everywhere, because they never want to listen to what I tell them. And they're scared or something. They don't go in the hole into the place where they're safe, and it's a pain in the butt. So I wait till it gets a little bit dark. Sometimes it's like pitch black dark outside. It's so dark, I walk out there and a spider web sticks me in the face. And I don't like that at all, so I try to keep my hands up. But when I take out my phone or something and I shine that light, I can see everything. Light lights up like crazy. And then all the bugs see it too, and they all fly right at me when I go out there. But light shines in the darkness, okay? The Bible even says the darkness doesn't even comprehend it. It has to go away when that light shines. But darkness and light don't mix together, okay? Things are either light or they're dark. And that's where we have to look at for, for how we get along with non-believers, all right? And this is what I want to explain so we don't go the wrong way and start divorcing wives or husbands or, or secluding ourselves to be the church of this and nobody else and we just have some kind of weird little society like some kind of David Koresh thing. We don't want anything like that, okay? Believers and unbelievers inhabit two opposing worlds. Christians are in Christ's kingdom, which is characterized by righteousness, light, and eternal life. Unbelievers are in Satan's kingdom, characterized by lawlessness, darkness, and spiritual death. The saved and the unsaved have different affections, beliefs, principles, motives, and goals, attitudes, and hopes. In short, they view life from opposing perspectives. We don't see life the same way. Consequently, relationships between believers and unbelievers are best limited to the temporal and the external. They may enjoy family ties, work at the same job, share in business relationships, live in the same community, experience the same hobbies and pastimes, and even agree on certain political and social issues. But on the spiritual level, believers and unbelievers live in two completely different worlds. 
You read your Bible, you're definitely going to see that. Okay, there's a difference between the believer and the unbeliever. And the and this is what I found at the top, which is so true. And we've preached about this before, I think even in Corinthians. The church grows stronger when Satan fights us. When people are trying to maybe shut down the church or say you're not allowed to be a Christian, you can't have your faith. You look at those kind of countries like in North Korea, Christians or Chinese, man, are they on fire for God. They're meeting at the expense of their life and their faith is so deep. And it's because Satan is fighting them. But the church grows way weaker when Satan is inside the church. When you have people in the church that are that are, have come in now, and now just the weakness comes. It's so much easier when bad things are opposing the church. But when bad things are within the church, everything gets so weak. All right, and and we read about that too. Truly, all the all the bad fellows preaching false gospels, heresies, and stuff—they don't come from outside the church. They came from inside the church. You know, they say that the sheep and wolves clothing. Those guys are are inside the church. They're not outside the church. It's a much better strategy from the devil to try to drag us in a different direction to get us from within than to get us from without, okay? We're not going to let the bad guy attack us. We're going to set defenses about him. But when the bad guy becomes our friend and sneaks right into our life and stuff and starts to tell us things, starts to whisper things in our ears, and we've already accepted him to a certain portion in our life, all of a sudden we start to believe all those kind of things. And that's what had happened in the Corinthian church. So that's why he said, separate yourselves from this stuff. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. It says in 1 John 2, 15, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So this is harsh, but it's Bible. That's why I'm putting verses up here, and I'm not just saying it, because then you'll think, well, that's just what Buck thinks. I'm telling you, interpret Bible with Bible. This is the view that the Bible has, is the world does not connect with God, okay? If all you do is watch the news all day, and that is really your religion, that's your religion. That's where you believe. And I tell you what, it's an empty belief, okay? It won't direct you into any kind of good way. Even people that watch the news all day long, they even talk about how dismal and how sad things are, and how horrible things are, and they're all heads down, and it just has a terrible view about everything in life, okay? There's not that much news out there that's uplifting. And, and that's the world. The, the, world's, the, world's, the world's hope really doesn't have any kind of hope to it. And I wrote, we cannot serve two masters. We cannot sit on the fence. We must be resolute. It says in, it says in Revelation chapter 3 about the church of Laodicea. There's seven churches that God talks about before the revelation kicks off. And they were churches that existed back in those days as well. And the church of Laodicea was sitting on the fence. One foot was in the world doing whatever everybody else was doing. One foot was in the church doing whatever the church was doing. And he said, I hate that. He goes, I will spit you out of my mouth, God said. He goes, I'd rather you either be cold or hot. Don't sit on the fence. Okay, so we got to separate ourselves. we got to decide, am I going to be over here in the world of unbelief, in the world of darkness, or am I going to be here in the world of light? And if we're in the world of light, we should not want to go back to that world of darkness. Okay, we want to we want to be fed. We want to have the joy. We want to be filled up with God. We want to walk and be the way He created us to be. This is the correct understanding of the separation. The separation demanded here does not refer to refusing association with those who do not follow a certain set of rules for living the Christian life. So that doesn't mean like you can't have any Christian, non-Christian friends. You can't work in non-Christian places. It doesn't mean this. As many legalistic Christians have advocated, and let me tell you, if you've been around some legalistic fellows, they can just put a hurt on you, all right? A real hurt, all right? It's a bad way to be a legalistic fellow. i got to watch myself constantly, because I don't ever want to be a legalistic fellow. I always see it as the road. There's the legalistic side in the one gutter, the liberalism in the other gutter, and i got to stay right in the center so I don't bump into each, any side of it. It says... It does not mean refusing to cooperate with those who teach the truth, but do not agree with all the distinctions of one's own theology or ministry style. You know how many people think that if you don't believe exactly the way that you believe, they believe, then you guys can't even work together? Tons of people are like that. It's horrible. We can surely get along with, with Methodists, you know, with Christian Missionary Alliance, with Pentecostals. We can get along with a lot of people because they believe in Jesus Christ, okay? We don't have to have the exact same beliefs to realize we're still brothers and sisters in Christ. Because if that's the case, then we're once again we're in that secluded type of church. 
And I'll tell you what, we're all like fingerprints. Even people within those kind of churches that all want to exactly think the same way have a little bit of variation too. And friction happens right there. And they get real angry with each other. No, this is the way it is. No, that's the way it is. And it gets ridiculous. All right? God doesn't want all that kind of friction. It says, nor does separation mean repeating complete, retreating completely from the world in the monastism and separating from unbelievers does not at some at Corinth imagine. So, okay, so because some of them said they believe they should divorce their spouse, their unbelieving spouse. In 1 Corinthians 7, it says, don't divorce your unbelieving spouse. Unless they want to leave, don't divorce them. I, I don't believe it was any accident anyways. I don't think anything's an accident. I believe everybody you've ever been married to, however your life's ever gone, it's part of God's plan. Part of God's plan. Biblical separation certainly does not cancel the church's responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, which you can't do if you're totally separated and you're all by yourself in some little corner. Okay, So we're supposed to be out there in the world. And we can look at the, look, this is actually from the New King James Version. Okay, different versions are read a little different ways, but, you know, you want to look and see, you know, what, how does it really come across the best way? What was it really said in the Hebrew or the Greek? Well, the New King James got it down pat on Amos 3.3. 3. It says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? You know, how can people live together and walk together and stuff unless they can agree? If they can't agree on anything, then they're always going to be butt heads and things. And that's where we've got to be working toward peace and be able to find things that we can agree on. Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Now this is the only time in the entire New Testament the word Belial comes across. The only time. In the Old Testament, it uses it a lot. And it calls them sons of Belial. And sons of Belial in an English translation would mean unworthy people. You know, uh, like uh, demons, people that are following after the wrong way is what the sons of Belial would be. And he's saying, what harmony does Jesus have with sons of Belial? And in context, he's referring to the people that are trying to preach false things in this church of Corinth, sons of Belial, unworthy people, people that are worthless. That, that, that's the kind of doctrine that he has. And it says, what kind of common in common do we have? They were totally opposing ends. And you could also think of the story with the Pharisees, how Jesus pointed out on the outside how beautiful they were. They were like whitewashed tombs, but on the inside on how desperately wicked and evil the Pharisees were. And the Pharisees looked great on the outside. I bet they would have outshined every single one of us in the way that we walk, the way that we live, in our Christian walk. They would have looked a lot better than all of us did. But the thing was, was on the inside, they were just horrible. They were torn apart. There was a storm wrenching like crazy on the inside. There was no inner peace right there. Way more important that we work on the inside first, and it comes out to the outside, then we try to get everything on the outside and then come in the inside. There's a story, there's a saying in the army that says, fake it till you make it. Now that can go across with some things and be okay, but that's not the way it should go in Christianity. All right? If you're a believer, you shouldn't be faking it until you become a believer. Okay, you should wrestle hard. If you're an unbeliever, wrestle hard with things. Dig into the scripture. Pray to God. Find out what the right way is and go from there. But don't just fake it till you make it because you won't ever make it. Okay, it'll just be a bunch of fake stuff on the outside. Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said. Christianity is incompatible with every form of false religion. One of the biggest stickers that bothers me so much on cars, I hope nobody has on the car, I'm going to bend you bad, but it's like that uh, wounded friend thing, okay? I don't mean to hurt you, I'm just trying to help you. But that sticker that says contradict, or it doesn't say contradict, coexist. I like contradict. It's another one that says coexist. And they say like they all believe the same thing and it's all fine. I'm telling you what, I've had Muslim folks I talk to, okay, and they try to tell me right away, we have the same God. And I say, do you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that He died for your sins on the cross? They're like, absolutely not. It's actually the highest sin a Muslim can make is to believe that. They call it a shirk. If you committed the sin of shirk, you are in for the deepest of the hellfire that you believe Jesus is the Son of God He died for your sin. So how is it that our main belief, the crux, the foundation of everything in Christianity is there? hardcore sin that you'll burn in hell forever on, how can you say we can coexist? can't coexist like that. Can we love one another? Yes, we can love one another. 
We can still love them just as Christ loves them because they're made in the image and the likeness of God. But do we say that we believe the same thing? No. Do we say that, that we're in the same camp? No, we're not. But yes, we can love one another, okay? Christianity is incompatible with false religions. And it says we are the temple of the living God. Men, these things in caps are not me trying to yell or anything. What that means is that it's requoted directly from the Old Testament. So Paul is using the same method of interpreting Scripture with Scripture. He says, I will dwell in them and walk among them. And if you go back to Ezekiel 8, it's a very interesting chapter that connects with this. It's basically the pagan folks in the land back in Ezekiel's time, which was a long time ago, had graffiti the temple of God. They have like all kinds of pagan sayings and false statues and idol things in the temple of God in the same place that the, that the high priests and all the people doing the sacrifices were going into worship and doing it. And how could they do this in this desecrated temple when this is supposed to be such a holy place? And God says, you know what? I've left that temple. I've left it. I'm no longer there. And they're still trying to do their church thing. They're trying to do this and that. But I will not be in this corrupted place that has things mixed together. Just read Ezekiel 8. Maybe read it from a newer translation. Because if you read Ezekiel 8 from an older translation and the kind of words they use and the poetic style, you won't know what's going on. Okay? So they do a good, a good study on Ezekiel 8. You'll see that. They graffitied the temple. And these guys were going in there. But God says, as he gives the hope, he says, I'm going to dwell with the people. I'm going to walk among them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. You know, God said, I'm going to be their God. And they're going to be my people. Christians have to make a clean break with false religion. We can't hold on to the old nest. You know, superstitions probably affect every one of us to a certain degree. Whenever I have a superstition, you know what I try to do? I make sure I do that superstition. A black cat walks in front of me, I'm like, praise God. Let it walk in front of me. All right? A bird tries to hit the window or come in, I'm like, praise God. Let the birds all come in and different things. All right? Because I don't believe in any superstitions. Because when you are believing in superstitions, you are also believing in the false lies and deception that comes with that stuff. Okay, that's not Bible stuff. That's false religion that's imprinted into us from our society and our culture. And if we let that stuff go in with us, it's bad. I saw a woman the other day on Facebook and she was fighting so hard. She wanted to sell her house. She's our neighbor. And a lot of her friends were like, you bury this statue upside down or something in your front yard. It'll sell. It'll sell. And she was fighting and she said, I'm not going to do that. I won't do it. She was real nice because that's just coincidence. I would have been like, that's heresy. That's a false religion. We're not putting our faith in statues upside down. We're putting our faith in the living God. Why don't you pray to the Lord? You know, why don't you try to sell your house better? Why don't you clean it up, make some cookies, make it smell good? Do things like that. But don't believe in some false superstition that that's going to work. Because now you're taking and you're living in both of those type of worlds right there. All right? It says, therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Every one of us wants to be welcomed by God. We all want to be welcomed by God. We may not want to be welcomed by one another. We get mad at each other, different things. But one thing for sure, we always want to be welcomed by God. And these are words of God. This is the Bible. There's one thing for you to say, Fuck, I don't believe what you say. That's okay. I don't mind. Don't believe whatever I say. But please believe every scripture that I read right here. Please believe your own Bible right here. And let it speak to your heart because it's from the Word of God. And I wrote, there's no comfort for unbelievers. But you know what? Awareness of sin. So some churches, okay, I'm talking some churches. I'm not saying all churches. I'm saying some churches, pretty much TV type churches, a lot of them. Not all of them. There's some good ones. But all they try to do is comfort everybody. Make them all feel so good. Make everybody feel so so cheery. There's nothing ever preached about that's a harsh preaching. Everything is just to puff you up and make you feel so good and fluffy inside. And that's not what God's telling us to do right here. Really, God wants us to be aware of our sin. Actually, every one of us should be aware that we're a sinner and we're in desperate need of God. Even after we're a believer, we're aware that we're sinners. We're aware that we need Jesus Christ. But we're also aware as a believer that He's paid the price for all of our sin. So like Romans 8.1 says, Therefore now there is no condemnation, there is no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because He's paid the price for us right there. But we're trusting in Him, we're following. And God wants us to be separate from the things in the world. 
I've heard it said before, and I truly believe it, that the more you love God, the more you hate sin. If you love sin just as much as you love God, there's a spiritual issue going on in your life. As you grow in God more, the sins that you love so much, you'll start to not like. Then you'll start to be irritated. Before long, you hate those sins right there, okay? A long time ago, I used to smoke cigarettes some. And you know what? I quit once for three years, and I went back to it again. And then eventually I quit then, and I have never smoked a cigarette since the, the year 2000. Not a one. Because I hate that stuff now. I don't ever want to smoke again. It's terrible. It'll kill you right there. One in three people die that smoke cigarettes. Probably the other two die of something else anyways that comes along. But I don't want to cut my chances by 30% of living a little longer the way God wants me to live. You know? But that's just an example. I'm not trying to beat you up. If you smoke cigarettes, maybe your time will come where you'll go from loving it, not liking it, irritated, hate it, and boom, you'll be gone with it right there. But it's got to be separations going on. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. This is how much God loves us. He says we'll be sons and daughters. You know, I read Psalm 22 yesterday. I don't know if you're following my daily Bible stuff, but man, have I got a book. This book is incredible. I'm actually reading an entire book over the next two weeks in order to write the daily Bible because it's so good about the Psalms. But Psalm 22, it has Jesus being prophesied, talks all about Jesus, 1,000 years before Jesus came to live on this earth. It's exactly about Jesus. Read Psalm 22. and you it, So it's crucifixion, everything. Psalm 22. And has Jesus talking and he says, My brothers, my brothers will follow me. Isn't this beautiful? Jesus calls me his brother. How could I be the brother of the living God who created all things and all these kind of things and yet he'll call me his brother? Isn't that a beautiful thing? And here God says that we'll be his sons and daughters. Talk about a love and how he'd be a father to us. These are the great, powerful things right here. And this kind of powerful love and things should cause you to be like, you know what? God doesn't like it. I'm not going to like it. Because God said so. I want to love him and I want to be in a good relationship with God. I'm not going to like that stuff. It's not doing it on your own works, your own power. You give it to God and let him do it. As you love him, you won't want to do those things. And I wrote God's promise. I wrote, don't be like Solomon who lost in the end by refusing separation. No, God warned Solomon. He said, you know what? The wives will be the end of you. He had a thousand wives. Imagine a thousand wives, okay? Some guys may think that's pretty cool, but you wouldn't if you really think about trying to live with a thousand wives or, I mean, what's it, 700 wives and 300 concubines. In the end, it destroyed Solomon. When you read about Solomon in the end, he didn't die in a good way. He started setting up temples to false gods. He went after false religions. Solomon, the most wisest man that ever lived on the earth and said never be a wiser man than him ever, fell in a hard, bad way. We don't want to be like Solomon. We want to separate from this kind of stuff. Right? If, if you, I tell you truly, Solomon, we believe, wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. In that book, you can see that Solomon was the richest man. Solomon was, had every wife. Solomon had all the gold. Solomon had everything. And yet, when you read that book, we read it in a Bible study for a while, and Bill and some other fellas. It's so sad. He's like, everything is vain. Everything is worthless. All of life is hopeless. That's just a picture you get through Ecclesiastes. And then you get to the end, and it sums it all up in the last verse. And it says, but man's way is to obey God's commandments and follow Him. That's what he came down to. After living a life where he had everything, including God too, and eventually the other stuff overwhelmed him right there, he said he ought to just obey God right there and follow his commandments. Then in all those things that he thought he'd find comfort, and peace, and happiness, he didn't find it in there. In fact, most rich guys you meet that are old rich guys, if they don't have the Lord, they're very unhappy fellows. You know, they can never have been rich enough. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilements of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And truly, the fear of God is the foundation of godly living. Every one of us should fear God. Every one of us should have a great respect for God. Did Jesus call me his brother in Psalm 22? Doesn't make me feel like the kind of brother that can uh, beat up the little brother, or to take advantage of him, or that we're on some kind of equal footing that uh, I can start telling him what to do. It tells me great privilege. Like, thank you, Lord, did you actually call me your brother? What a privilege that is to me. And truly, the fear of God is where it says the beginning of wisdom in life starts in the Bible. That's where everything starts, by starting to fear God and realize that I should be afraid of God. The ungodly, 
People who don't believe in Jesus don't fear God. They don't believe they're going to go to hell. They don't believe there's any kind of bad things that are going to happen to them. They don't even know it. They're dead and blind to it all. When someone starts to become a Christian, they start to fear God. And as they start to fear God, they search out His Word, they pray, they get to know Him, Holy Spirit starts working inside of them, all these things happen, and the next thing you know, they are like, wow, did I not know anything about any of this stuff right here. It really opens up their eyes to truth. Now i got to go to the end slide. See how I find my little notes here? All right. Last slide, I'm asking you today, are you separate from the world and supportive of one another? Truly, this is what we saw. We're supposed to be loving one another. We're supposed to be have that kind of love like Paul had, even toward the people who are totally against us. And we're supposed to be separated from the world. And this doesn't mean separate as you live in a box and you don't let anybody in unless they're exactly like you. Because eventually you'll find that nobody's exactly like you and you won't go to any church at all and you're the only one that's right. And there's people that some of you guys know, they're like that. I know one of you guys tells me about these people every day. <laughs> but I'm telling you, don't let that be you, okay? Be out there in society. Be out there in life. Definitely be in the church and around other fellow believers and things. But don't let all those things saturate you. It's like a chaplain book I'm reading. I told a few of you guys about it. It's called The Postmodern View. Now, right away, it upset me, because postmodernism means there's no absolutes and truth is relative. Truth is whatever truth is to that person at that time. That's the postmodern view, and it's really the, the, the world view, the news view right now. It's been the news view for however long the news has ever been around. Even if people used to just uh, talk in the streets or something before there was TV. But the world view is truth is whatever is truth to you. And as I'm reading this book... It could be a very good approach to chaplaincy because when you're with the person you're being a chaplain for, you're there to love them. You're not there to preach to them, you're there to love them. And as I'm loving them, if I try to tell them, no, no, your story is all messed up. That's not the way things are. I'm not going to be able to love them, okay? And they're not going to take that as love either, all right? I need to be able to sit with them in their story. And I can buy the book for things like that. I can understand I need to be able to be there, be fascinated with their story, love their story, and be with them, but I don't have to agree with their story. But neither do I have to tell them I don't agree either, okay? I don't have to let them know that. I don't have to cut all the ties with them and things like that. But I can be there and I can really love my neighbor. But in this book with this lady, she said, I need to actually bully postmodernism as well then she would have to say that I have the view that my story is just a story too, and who knows what the real story is. I'll tell you what, I know what the real story is. I know who the living God is. I know that Jesus came and He died for me, that He paid the price for all my sin. I know that He rose from the dead and more than 500 people were witnesses to it. I know that it's changed the world in a way that no other religion has ever changed the world. In fact, most of the world rely on the time of before Christ and in the year of our Lord. I know that all these things are not some kind of made-up fantasy, that I'm living this made-up fantasy story as well as other people's stories that are outside of Christ maybe. So I don't take a postmodern approach to myself, but I can definitely take a postmodern approach when I'm loving other people and realize that what they are telling me is what they really believe. And you know what? Perhaps the love that I show them, being with them, loving them, helping them, maybe they'll start to see some kind of godly light in that. And maybe then they'll be open to see some real truth as well later. But that's that's a difference right there. And we got to be like, are we separate? Or how are we doing it? And to disobey God's commands is to separate from unbelievers is foolish. So if we try to put ourselves in a box and we don't get around any other believers, this is what it is. It's foolish, it's blasphemous, and it's ungrateful, and it forfeits God's blessings. Okay? That's if we become like Church of Laodicea, and we're one with them. We're not one, okay? But yet we can go and we can love them. We can go into their areas, we can love people, wherever they are, whoever they are. There's still somebody that God made. They're still made in the image and likeness of God. But yet we don't have to start to pick up those beliefs like that book I told you about telling time me that I should have a postmodern view myself. Okay, I don't have a postmodern view. I'm, I'm what they call the exclusive view. You know, Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. It's Bible. Okay, I, 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 I'm a Bible man. What it says in the Bible, that's what I let speak to my heart through and through. What other folks speak to me, I always consider, I listen, I think about it. But at the end of the day, what's going to have the authority is the Bible. 
And if I pick up some wrong perception from somebody talking to me, and then I read the Bible's perception is totally different, I've got to be willing to submit, to repent, and to follow after what the Bible says, and not just go with what emotionally felt good to me at the time, with those kind of affections that went over me. Because the Bible is God's Word, it's not man's Word. With this, we'll go ahead and close, and I usually pray, and I'm not going to try and woo anybody, but if anybody...